I'm here this morning on the National Mall next to the United States Capitol, which yesterday was the site of chaos and mayhem. And yet, in the early hours of this morning, it was also the place where the Congress of the United States certified the results from the presidential election of 2020. The juxtaposition of those two events reminded me of a photograph taken on March the 4th, 1861, during the first inaugural of Abraham Lincoln, when he stood here at the United States Capitol and offered a message of unity and reconciliation to a fractured nation. I was reminded of the fact that our democracy is always unfinished. It's always under construction. And that every American in every generation plays a part to make sure that we are truly a strong, united states of America. So to all Salvationists, I issue this challenge today. Let us be what Christ has called us to be. Let us manifest the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that we have through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the midst of a dark winter, our nation needs these things now more than ever. And to the nation as a whole, I offer this pledge. The Salvation Army in the fulfillment of its mission to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and meet human needs in his name without discrimination will redouble its efforts to work with everyone of every background and experience, of every political party, of every ethnic group, to ensure that we are able to say that we are a united, strong country in which everyone can become what God intends us to be. At the conclusion of his address, Lincoln said this, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of union. When again touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. God bless you.
Welcome to the Massachusetts Divisional Worship. We're so glad you could join us this week. We're wonderfully blessed that you have welcomed us into your home, into your life, into your family. For many of you right now, you hold me in the palm of your hand. This week, that's where we start our call to worship that just as you hold me in the palm of your hand, God holds you in the palm of his hand. In the middle of all the chaos of these past few weeks and days, God himself holds you in the palm of his hand. In fact, I'd invite you to turn with me to hear what Jesus himself says about this matter. John 10, 27 through 29 says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish, nor shall anyone snatch them from my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them from my Father's hand. Friends, Jesus declares that he holds us in the palm of his hand. No matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, he is our God. We are his people. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who is still in control. You are a God who still invites us to your throne room, to sit in your majesty, to receive your grace. And so, Lord, today, we do just that as your dear children. We sit before your throne, and we ask that your grace would be lavished out, that your riches would overpour in our lives. For Lord, we pray it in your Son's most precious name. Amen. Friends, please join us for our first congregational song, How Deep the Father's Love.
Our scripture reading for this morning is found in Ephesians chapter 1, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavishes on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to the, his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their f- fulfillment, to bring all things into heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in a conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eye of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly father far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present, but also in the time to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. May God help us understand these words today. There are so many things that I just don't understand. Like this, why do your feet smell but your nose runs? Why do people drive their cars on a parkway but park their cars in a driveway? Why are SpongeBob's parents round but he's a square? Why does Walmart have so many checkout lines but hardly any of them are ever open? Why do our fingers and toes get wrinkly when we go swimming? Why do we cook bacon but we bake cookies? Life is full of mysteries, and if you're anything like me, there's things that can be hard to understand, like math. Well, you know what? There's one thing that isn't a mystery. One thing that I know with complete certainty, God can always be trusted, and his way is perfectly good. In the Bible, there was a king named Solomon who asked God for wisdom so that he could make the right decisions and help others in his kingdom make the right decisions. Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, which is near the middle of your Bible. Proverbs is filled with tons of godly advice for you and for me, like this from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and don't depend on your own understanding. Remember the Lord in all that you do, and he will make your path straight. Have you ever been lost before? Maybe you got lost in a store, or in the woods, or maybe even in a car? It's easy to get lost when we don't have the right directions. Well, did you know that we can end up in a whole lot of trouble when we don't rely on God's truth? In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus told a story about two different people 
who built their house in two different places. Now the first builder was wise because he knew that his house needed a strong foundation. And so he chose to build his house on top of a rock. The rains and storms came and the, the wind beat against the house, but because it was built on a solid foundation of rock, the house stood strong. Now the other builder was pretty foolish. He thought that building his house on a foundation of sand would be just fine. And so that's exactly what he did. Have you ever built a sandcastle at the beach? What happens when a wave of water hits a sandcastle? It gets destroyed, right? Well, guess what? That's exactly what happened to the foolish builder. The storms came and the waters rose and that brand new house that he had built on the sand came crashing down. Why do you think Jesus told this story? Well, you see, Jesus wanted to show us that our lives are a lot like those houses. Where we build our life makes a huge difference. The wise builder built upon the rock. Jesus is our rock. He wanted to give us this picture to help us realize the importance of trusting him as our source of understanding and truth. When our life is built on Christ, we have confidence and hope no matter what we see going on in the world around us, no matter what storms or difficulties come our way. But when we rely on our own understanding and when we try to do things on our own, we become just like that house built on sand, swept away by worries and fears. You see, only Jesus provides wisdom and understanding that is perfectly reliable. He gives us power to stand strong and secure against the dangerous, confusing things of this world. God's Word, the Bible, is very clear on what's right and what's wrong. And God has given you his word to read. He's given you his word to study and to remember every time that you're tempted to lean on your own understanding. He's also given you family members, friends, teachers, and leaders at church who love you and who want to help you understand what makes God happy. And you know what else? Whenever we pray, God hears our prayers. We can talk to God anytime and anywhere, and he will help us see the straight path. He won't let us go astray if we build our lives on him. Aren't you glad that Jesus can always be trusted? I know that I am. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a firm foundation that we can build our lives upon. Lord, we know in this world there are so many things that are false. Lord, there are so many things that are confusing. There are so many things that are dark and things, Lord, that try to, to sidetrack us and, and keep our eyes off of you. But Lord, we pray today that you would be our confidence, you would be our strength. And so, Lord, today we pray that whenever we're tempted to look the wrong way, God, or to act uh, in a way that we know does not bring glory or honor to you, God, we'll be reminded of the wise and the foolish builders. God, when we build our life on you, we can never go wrong. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we can lean on your understanding. And so, God, I just pray that you give us the strength and the power to do that each and every day as we live for you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Hi, we're the Castillos, and we go to Quincy Core. I'm Emmy. I'm Peyton. I'm Kristen. And I'm Rick. And we're here to kind of share a little bit about what our family has gone through and how we've changed over this last year. Hey, Emmy, so what did you think about quarantine? Um, it was stressful. How come? Because it was really hard to wear a mask. I didn't like it. Um, some of my favorite places were actually closed. Was it hard to not see friends and be with your teachers and stuff like that too? Yeah. Yeah, so if all that was really hard, what did you do to get through it? How did you, how did you do it? I prayed to God and it really worked. Oh, so you're telling us that Jesus is a way to get through things and when you know him, it's so much better? Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Hey, how about you? How was quarantine for you this past year? Difficult. How come? Staying inside all the time, not being able to go outside, not being able to see family and friends. Same kind of stuff as Emmy, right? How did you get through it? Like, what was a change that you could see is taking place and has taken place over this last year? Well, I have realized that I physically and mentally changed over the year. 
because I have learned to try new things and some friends and my pastors helped me spiritually get closer to God. So again, maybe another thing that we could say that Jesus got you through this. So do you both think that you know Jesus a little bit better because of this last year? Yeah. And how did you get to know him better? What did you do to get to know him better? I started praying more often. How about you, Emmy? How did you get to know him better? What did you do? Um, the same as Pepe. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about that too. Did you ever read God's word this year? Yeah. Yeah. We call God's word the truth, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is, that's something I think is true as well. For me, it's been hard just because um, there's a lot of different things that we're used to that we don't get to do, like the church fellowship. Um, being with other people, being able to pray with other people, being able to um, just converse uh, with the body of Christ. And um, personally, in our, in my life especially, um, uh, I've gone through some changes at my job and, and some other things that are pretty stressful. And um, sometimes you wonder what's going to happen, how you're going to make, um, make it through. Um, you know, what's the new situation going to be like? And much like COVID, um, a lot of things are up in the air. And so um, it's helpful to know that Christ will see us through and that uh, we can rely on him. And no matter what the situation, uh, we know that he's always on the other side and we've gone ahead of us. And um, the Bible is a great way to uh, jump into his word and to know that, to experience that again, and to uh, be able to um, rely on him to get us through the tough times and I think a lot of us have done that and we found ways to be able to extend ourselves uh, in, with other people as well uh, through emails, phone calls, um, just to stay in touch with the body and let them know uh, that we're praying for them, things are going to be okay and uh, uh, hopefully the, all this will be over soon and uh, you know um, I believe that God is going to get us through this and, uh, and that the hope is on the other side. And I think that, as I was saying to Emmy and to Peyton, the word that keeps coming to my mind through others and through just what I see is the truth. Like when we trust in the Lord and we get to know him better, the things that we have to face, the things that we go through, whether it's mental changes, physical changes, spiritual changes, when we put our hope and trust in God and we get to know him better and have a better understanding of who he is through his word, through praying with him and to him, we get to know that the truth is God's word. Uh, the, the scripture that stuck out to me today is, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people. And I think about the fact that when we know the truth, the light shines in, it shines into the darkness. And I think about the world we're living in right now, whether it's COVID or political unrest, the, the racial injustice, we know the truth and it's Jesus. It's getting to know him better. And I believe that wholeheartedly that when we draw close to him, he draws close to us. He pursues us. And I would love to continue to pursue him. What about you guys? Let's pursue him in 2021. Hi friends. My name is Captain Patricia Edwards. And I'd like to take this time as we go into our, our time of prayer And I'd like to encourage you to open up your hearts and just let God come into your hearts as you meditate on our prayer this morning. I know there's been a lot of chaos going on in um, not even the world, but in our own cities and states and the country. And I ask that you just take this time to reflect on that and just to get any worries out of your heart right now and to just give it to God as we go into prayer. Um, Not only do we have the chaos that's been going on in the Capitol in the past, but, you know, even during these days and as we go into the next week with inauguration, the fear and the worries are there. And I just ask you to give that to God now as we're in this time of prayer. And even as we fight this pandemic, the unknown of that in the world today, um, again, I just ask you to give that to God. Let God have that and he will take care of you. So I ask that we just take this time right now and as we go into this prayer. Father God, Lord, um, we just, we bow so humbly at your feet this morning, Father God, and we thank you, Father. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, Father God, and we thank you for your protection, Father God. 
Father, I ask right now for those that are listening to this service that, Father, you be with them, Father, and you, you just take away any worries and anxieties that they have, Father God. I ask that they're able to open their hearts to you and just to let you in, Father God, and just, just to know that you have it, Father, that you are in control. There's so much going on, Father, in our own cities and towns and the state, in the, at the capital, Father God. And it, it, it affects our lives. It affects that way that we feel and the fears and worries that we have, Father God. And I ask that you take these fears and worries away, that your hedge of protection is upon each and every one, Father, and that you are in this, Father God, that it's your face that everybody sees through all the chaos, Father God. Father, I ask for those right now that may be in the, the midst of the pandemic as maybe a loved one or themselves have COVID or they're just recovering from it, Father, I ask that you take any fears and worries that they have and I ask that you put your healing hand upon them. So, Father, I just ask as we go into the service this morning, we've heard songs about peace. We ask that this peace be upon each and every one of us and that our hearts are open to listen to the word, Father God, so that we can fully, fully be deep in a relationship with you. And we ask this all in your most heavenly name. Amen. I grew up in small town Ohio, the youngest of four children at a time and in a place that the prevailing parental philosophy could be summed up with the phrase, go outside and play. This was particularly true in the summer months and resulted in some interesting adventures. As the youngest, I was usually tagging along with my two older brothers, engaging in activities that were a little too advanced for my age. I sometimes marvel at the fact that I survived my childhood. One summer in particular, my oldest brother heard of this old abandoned strip mine out in the country. It was a considerable distance from our house. It was lined with jagged cliffs, filled with crystal clear water, and required illegal trespassing to use. So naturally that became our swimming hole for the summer. The interesting part was that despite the fact that the water was the clearest I have ever seen, you still can never see the bottom of this old mine. The middle brother Dave would climb to the top of a cliff about 30 feet high and jump in. My oldest brother Brian would go up to that same cliff and then climb a tree on top of the cliff to jump in. No one ever touched the bottom. And then there was me. I had no interest in locating the bottom. Since there was no zero level entry or sandy beach to walk in from, I would go to the lowest cliff, about 10 feet high, and jump in, staying as close to the wall of the cliff as possible. I was afraid of going deep. I wanted to stay near the surface. I wanted an easy exit strategy. This was probably wise for that particular situation. However, I've noticed over the years that this is how many people choose to live life, with the fear of going deep. It seems to be part of our human nature. Stay near the surface. Don't commit. Don't get involved. Stick to the surface where it is safe and comfortable, where there's an easy exit strategy. So we start out 2021 during this time of natural introspection and new beginning. I encourage you to resolve to go deep to dive into life in 2021. And over these next few weeks, we will be looking at challenges presented to the church in Ephesus. Before we dive into today's scripture reading, I just need to say a few things as a bit of an overview. First, about the, the author of the letter. The Bible was written in large part by ordinary, uneducated men. There are, of course, exceptions like Solomon and Isaiah in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, Paul. Paul was a man of deep thoughts. And as we read certain portions of his letters to, our, to the different churches, our eyes kind of gloss over as our brains attempt to comprehend what exactly he's trying to say. Ephesians 1 is one of the clearest examples of this. The other issue to mention up front is about the recipients of this letter. Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus is rather unique as Paul is not addressing any certain sin or heresy. He's not offering any correction. He is simply challenging the Ephesians to go deeper in their faith, deeper in their, their obedience, deeper in their dedication to the Lord. 
he starts by calling them to a deeper understanding of their identity. Ephesians chapter 1 starts with a greeting. Then in verses 3 to 14, there's a doxology recounting all God has done. That in the original Greek is all one sentence and then concludes with Paul's prayer. This chapter is rich with deep truths and is key to Christian doctrine. First, Paul writes to offer a greater understanding of our position as believers. In verse 3, he writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. God has blessed us. Blessing here means to benefit, to prosper. This was new language to the Greek Roman culture. Their gods did not bless. Zeus did not prosper any mortal. Humans were there simply to serve the gods. No blessing, the people, was unique to Yahweh. Over 400 times in the Old Testament, we read of individuals being blessed by God. And here Paul writes that we are blessed from the beginning with every spiritual blessing, not necessarily material blessings, though many preachers today would try to make you believe that. Most importantly, these blessings are in Christ. This is the position of the believer. Paul drives this point home using the phrase in Christ or in Him, speaking of our position in verses 3, 4, 6, 7, 9, and 11. So how do we reach such a blessed position? First, by the selection of the Father. In verse 4, Paul writes, for He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. This selection, Paul will explain, is the result of God's love, is in accordance with God's will, but it is dependent upon our belief. In verse 13, he writes, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and having believed... This qualification reminds us that selection is based on what we believe, not on who we are. We also reach this position because of the sacrifice of the Son. In verse 7, we read, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In the Greco-Roman world, slaves did not need to be slaves for life. They could be redeemed. A price needed to be paid to buy back their freedom. Jesus paid the price for our redemption so that we could be free in Him. We are also in our position because of the seal of the Holy Spirit. We read, having believed you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. This seal was a signature guaranteeing, approving, authenticating the message or comment within. Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit as that guarantee, a down payment on the full glory that is to be ours who are, as we are in Christ. So be mindful of your position. I'm reminded of that announcement that I've heard so many times at amusement parks. Please keep your arms, legs, and heads inside the vehicle at all times. This morning I say, please keep your whole self, your thoughts, your attitudes, your will in Christ at all times. Paul also offers instruction on our deeper understanding of our purpose. We are in Christ for a purpose. In verse 4 we read, For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Be reminded today that we are called to be holy, to be set apart, committed fully and wholly to Him. The word blameless refers to the animals sacrificed in the Old Testament that were without defect. We cannot meet this standard outside of our connection to Christ and His atoning blood that scrubs us clean. I think it's particularly important to emphasize in light of the ever-growing discord in our world that to be holy and blameless, to truly fulfill His purpose for us, we must lead with love and grace and compassion. 
Holiness is not simply about our relationship with God, but also our, our relationship with our fellow humans. Lastly, Paul moves from praise to prayer, opening our eyes to a deeper understanding of our potential. He prays, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. He writes of our potential that is grounded in the past in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you. This is the call of salvation. He continues regarding our purpose that is rewarded in the future, the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and that is realized in the present and His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of His mighty strength. Paul continues to explain that this present power emanates from Jesus, our risen and ascended Lord, who has been given all power and authority. And then he comes, and then comes the great part for us. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. We are a people empowered from on high to accomplish divine purpose here below. Yet we so often sit here saying, woe is me, feeling like victims, complaining about our culture rather than endeavoring to change our culture, even if one person at a time. I spent my freshman year at college at the University of Toledo. I went there with my best friend, Jason. Uh, um, I studied psychology and he studied engineering. Jason had an impressive scientific mind. At one point, he spent a couple weeks building a homemade Van de Graaff generator. This machine is one that uses static electricity to create an electrical current, and thus the electrical shock when you touch it. The interesting thing is that this current will use the human body as a conductor. So if you're touching the generator, the power will flow through you, and you can then shock someone else. And the more people that the power flows through, the greater shock. As the only two uh, people creating a new contact would feel the shock, we could create a human chain inside our dorm room connected to the generator, and either Jason or I would stand at the doorway to shake hands with people walking by. It was really good fun. And now my hair won't seem to lay down. But you get the point. As we are in Christ, connected to the power source, that power grows stronger with each new person connected. We hold an honored position with a heavenly purpose, and we need to harness the power of Christ to accomplish His purposes. As we respond to God's Word today, I invite you to sing or meditate on the words of this song that challenge us to to calm contemplation of the presence, the glory, and the power of the one who defines our position, our purpose, and our potential. I invite you to sing with me, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord.
Thank you, Major Jugendheimer, for that gift of God's precious word to us. Friends, I'd also like to remind you of three ways that you could continue your giving to the Lord. First, you could mail your offering or tithe directly to your core. Second, you could set up a bill pay through your local bank. Third, the territory has adapted Tithely. It's, it's an app that you can download and give your tithe through the app directly to your core. When you download this app that shall appear on the screen for you, you want to make sure that you designate your core. Lastly, friends, if you have any questions about any of those three options, feel free to reach out. Your core officer and many others are waiting to help you navigate some of these waters. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you allow us to have our lives, to have our very being. So, Lord, out of that gratitude, we give back to you, to your mission, to your cause, to your kingdom. In these moments, Lord, we ask that you would bless what is given and bless those who would receive. And Lord, we would earnestly ask that it would build your kingdom for your purposes. We pray all of this in your Son's precious name. Amen. And now, friends, receive the benediction from John 16. Do you now believe, Jesus replied? A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each of you, to your own home, you will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things, so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Peace be with you, friends.